This week on Bloomberg Green, the green energy of the future, how to make clean hydrogen and its benefits for the planet. Flying high, we take a look at the practical uses of green hydrogen as jet fuel. To hydrogen fuel cell being the best approach from the cost of fuel, efficiency of utilization of the fuel, and the uh, mitigation of the climate effects. And from a small part of the energy picture to making it available for all, we talk the challenges and opportunities in widening access to green hydrogen. My biggest dream is to see green hydrogen become mainstream, actually, and not just to have these, these little pockets of applications or these demos, but for it to really become the, the fuel of the future. From Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. A world desperate for a clean energy fuel is pinning its hopes on hydrogen, seeing it as a way to power factories, buildings, and trucks without pumping heat trapping carbon dioxide into the sky. But scientists are beginning to warn there's a catch. Hydrogen that leaks into the atmosphere can cause 40 times more warming over a few decades than the same amount of carbon dioxide. So the question remains, how do we make it cleanly? Now, hydrogen has big advantages as a clean fuel. While the vast majority of the hydrogen produced today is stripped from natural gas in a process that releases carbon dioxide, it can also be separated from water using renewable power with no emissions but oxygen. We dig deeper into the details. Hydrogen has a very special place in the universe. It's the first element on the periodic table. It is the most abundant element in the universe. And when clean energy advocates think about what can we find which would be as easy to use as fossil fuels, they think about hydrogen. The fuel that will, when burned, only produce water. We like to imagine that if we just built enough of these and these, we could ditch fossil fuels and save the planet. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. There are some things where you just need good old-fashioned combustible fuel. Now startups around the world are betting that hydrogen can become the fuel of the 21st century. Just like today, we use fossil fuels for different applications, like power plants, cars and trucks and trains. Hydrogen will be used for all this variety of different applications. But turning the most common element in the universe into the new fuel of choice is harder than it might seem. The first thing you need to know about hydrogen is that not all hydrogen is created equal. Allow us to introduce the hydrogen rainbow. Hydrogen is unique because you can generate it in many different ways and uh, the different ways in which it is created actually are defined by colors. The rainbow scales from the most environmentally friendly to the least. Gray hydrogen means taking natural gas and converting that into hydrogen while creating CO2 emissions in the process. Blue hydrogen is gray hydrogen, but with carbon capture instead. So there are no CO2 emissions that are put into the atmosphere. Instead, they are captured and buried deep underground. There's also pink hydrogen, where you use nuclear power to create hydrogen. One color is prized above them all, green. Green hydrogen is the hydrogen that everybody wants because it's the hydrogen that uses renewable electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. If we could make enough green hydrogen, we'd have a clean fuel source with incredible versatility, making electricity whenever we need it, powering heavy industry, and theoretically, even replacing fossil fuels in some of the most polluting forms of transportation. Today, though, most hydrogen is produced on the polluting end of the spectrum. So engineers are working on getting green hydrogen up to speed. At H2Pro, we're developing a new technology that splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. 
Talman Marco founded and sold two app companies for more than a billion dollars before following his green dreams and starting H2 Pro in 2019. The process of splitting water has been known for over 200 years. You put two electrodes in a glass of water uh, with some salt, turn on the power, and you get hydrogen and oxygen bubbles. Today I was in the, my son's uh, classroom and I showed them an experiment of how we can split water very easily. I just took a nine volt battery, placed it in the water with some salt, and voila, you have hydrogen and oxygen coming out. That's nice, but it's very, very inefficient and therefore very, very costly. The hard thing is how to make hydrogen efficiently and with low cost. Our technology is different in the fact that it's more efficient and it's cheaper to manufacture, resulting in cheaper hydrogen for our customers. That's made possible by a fancy engineering trick. Conventional electrolyzers use electricity not just to create hydrogen molecules, but also to separate out unwanted oxygen molecules. H2 Pro found a way to separate the oxygen using heat instead. We have the oxygen being released just by raising the temperature. So we are releasing the oxygen without uh, applying any power. This is the reason why we can be so much uh, more efficient. Uh, this is the unique technology of uh, H2 Pro. These specific electrodes themselves, they release the oxygen. The next level, when we're going to make our factory, it's going to work in a very similar approach like here. H2 Pro's fighting an uphill battle just by virtue of being green. Electrolysis makes up just 2% of hydrogen production today, and many investors didn't see the potential for growth. Initially, it was very, very difficult to raise money for H2 Pro. In fact, we had to reach to over 100 funds until we managed to get the company funded. The scaling is never easy. Our system produces 500,000 times more hydrogen than where we were three years ago. But we still have a ways to go. The ultimate test will be whether H2 Pro can make its product cheaply enough to race ahead of its more established competition. The long-term goal for hydrogen to become a viable fuel is for it to cost between a dollar or two dollars a kilogram. We are nowhere close to that. We are probably in the three or four or five dollars range for green hydrogen today. We anticipate that our customers will have a cost of about one dollar per kilogram of green hydrogen by the end of this decade. Companies like H2 Pro still have a long way to go before they're producing green hydrogen at scale. But being green isn't the only way to be green. That'll make sense in a minute. We describe what we're doing at C0 as turquoise hydrogen, because it's kind of a combination of both blue and green in that it's low cost uh, and low emission. C0 has developed a technology for removing the carbon in natural gas. Uh, natural gas is a hydrocarbon. It's made out of hydrogen and carbon. And what we do is uh, remove the carbon and so we pull out the solid carbon out of the hydrogen that we produce, and there are no direct CO2 emissions because anything that would have been CO2 is instead solid carbon. If you want to get hydrogen from water, it takes seven and a half times as much energy to go pull hydrogen off of oxygen by splitting water as it does to pull hydrogen off of carbon through our process. The way C0 achieves it is using molten salts. Uh, it has a big chamber full of salt that is heated to a very high temperature. So this is an example of one of our uh, laboratory scale reactors. So right here we have a very high temperature around 1000 degrees and, and slightly above uh, molten media column. And it bubbles natural gas through that chamber, leaving behind carbon in its elemental form and hydrogen is a gas that can be trapped and sold. If we're successful, we're producing piles of black carbon um, that ultimately gets sequestered back into the ground. You can think of it almost as pre-combustion carbon capture. Rather than ending up 
with CO2 that you have to concentrate, compress, put into a pipeline and inject it underground. We pull it out ahead of time as a solid that's much denser um, and you can move around with conventional solids handling equipment and dispose of. Just like green hydrogen, the success of turquoise hydrogen will ultimately come down to cost. A dollar fifty per kilogram of hydrogen is our target for doing this at very large scale. If you can be two dollars a kilogram or less with, you know, very low to zero CO2 emissions, that's kind of a game changer. That was a look at making green hydrogen. And coming up, as hydrogen becomes an ever more crucial energy source, we'll discuss the practical uses of the green power, including in the aviation space. This is Bloomberg Green. Welcome back to Bloomberg Green. I'm Kaylee Lines from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. The commercial uses of green hydrogen are limited, but as the industry develops, uses could be transformative for airlines and aviation. We take a deeper look at making jet fuel green. It seems like everything is going green these days. But there's one mode of transportation that seems to be clinging to the traditional fuel-loving ways. And while commercial aviation has made strides through smarter design and cleaner engines, many of those gains have been nullified by more air traffic. The challenge is enormous. This is a large industry. It will take decades to convert. The good news is that we will have a solution as early as three years out that people can get into and, and start moving zero emission. And it turns out that the solution could be all around us. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. And so if you had to use something, <laughs> it would be great. The only product of the chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen is water. We looked at the fundamentals of what it would require to take an aircraft up in the air of significant size over significant distance, commercially relevant. You get to hydrogen fuel cell being the best approach from the cost of fuel, efficiency of utilization of the fuel, and the uh, mitigation of the climate effects. Serial clean tech entrepreneur Val Miftikov started Zero Avia following his previous success in the EV charging industry. So the beauty about Hydrogen in general is that the energy density of hydrogen as fuel is, is actually three times better than jet fuel. So you can see any size of aircraft going for any distance that jet fuel aircraft can go over time. Right? It, it will just take a significant amount of time to get the industry over, but this technology can scale to all sizes of aircraft that we use in commercial service. Zero Avia uses a hydrogen fuel cell to produce electricity to turn a propeller. Unlike a traditional engine, which uses combustion to create energy, a fuel cell generates electricity through an electrochemical reaction. In this case, hydrogen and oxygen are combined to generate electricity, heat, and water. Zero Avia has flown a six-seater aircraft on a hydrogen fuel cell, a world first. Now they're aiming bigger, at 20 seats. That's technically commercial. One side of the aircraft, the left side, we replace the engine with our power plant. We still got the normal engine on the uh, right side. And part of this is, uh, you know, in aviation, you want to uh, ramp up a risk profile on, in meaningful steps. So uh, anything happens, we have the second engine. Uh, but even in the first um, flight test campaign, uh, what we're planning to do is to demonstrate operation of this aircraft purely on zero emission power. On the left side engine, uh, once we take off, we're able to switch over to completely uh, zero emission power. Hydrogen is used throughout all sections of the flight. That maximizes the efficiency of the entire operation. That reduces the weight, provides for best uh, sort of mission capabilities, uh, payload and range. Building power plants and fuel cells is one thing. 
Creating a whole new infrastructure for supplying hydrogen is something entirely different. In automotive, a big part of the reason why hydrogen did not take off is because the fueling infrastructure needs to be so distributed. So let's say in the United States, you have 100,000 fueling stations. Compare that with aviation, where 95% or more traffic in the United States is concentrated in 100 locations. Right? So that's a three-order magnitude difference, which makes build-out of the infrastructure much simpler. It's much larger, much more concentrated stations, but they're much fewer um, uh, in quantity. Calling it simpler might be underselling the challenge of distributing hydrogen which, unlike other fuels that can be easily transported in liquid form, is usually found instead in a gaseous state. How do you get the hydrogen from point A to point B? We don't have pipelines for moving hydrogen around. We don't have all the specialized trucks to move them around. And so we got thinking, we need a solution that can be a low capital expenditure solution. And that's the genesis of the company. John Paul Clark is the co-founder and chief innovation officer of Universal Hydrogen, a startup that has designed a modular tank system for the domestic turboprop market. Like Zero Avia, it allows for retrofitting planes already in use. Each module has two capsules, and so what we do is load it into the aircraft as if it was cargo, strap it down, connect it to the aircraft, close the loading door, and that would be it. When you get to your destination, you'd basically unload it, put it back in a truck, send it back to the um, production site to get refilled. We needed to basically come up with something that could both fit in containers and also fit in the aircraft, not require increases in the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft. This compromise is one of the biggest hurdles that may prevent widespread adoption of hydrogen. Obviously, you're going to have to take out some seats because the energy density of hydrogen is less than jet fuel, and you can't store it in the wings practically, so you're going to have to take away some space in the fuselage. In the ultra-fine margins of aviation, removing 10 to 20 percent of your seats is a tough ask, but that hasn't deterred startups like Zero Avia or Universal Hydrogen. The maintenance cost of a fuel cell motor system goes down, and it goes down significantly, because motors and fuel cells have much fewer moving parts than a gas turbine engine. And so the wear and tear is much lower, and therefore the time between overhaul is longer. And so when you put all that together, our numbers indicate that the chasm cost per available seat mile actually goes down slightly or is at the worst equivalent to what you have now. So what you will have is a smaller cabin, a smaller number of seats. However, the cost for each of those seats to operate it is the same or better with the hydrogen. A look there at the potential for a greener kind of jet fuel. And coming up, after years of dabbling, companies are finally planning the kind of large-scale investments that would make green hydrogen a serious business. This is Bloomberg Green. Welcome back to Bloomberg Green. I'm Kaylee Lines from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. So how can we make green hydrogen available for all? Is it a question of investment or infrastructure? Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua spoke with Vitea Cohen, a leader in the clean energy space, about that. So as a technology provider, our focus is on driving down the cost of the electrolyzer. And so we're taking responsibility for driving down the capex of this electrolyzer. And we believe that once we go into mass production next year, we can drive down the cost of green hydrogen to be cost competitive with fossil fuels. At what, point, at what point can it actually replace fossil fuel mm -hmm. full stop? Does it have to be cheaper than fossil fuels? It should, right? And so we are aiming for 1.5 euros per kilogram for the capex cost um, coming, so for the cost of the green hydrogen that comes out of our electrolyzers. And we believe that we have the right technology and we have the right strategy to drive down the cost at this point. So what did you enter the Earthshot Prize? So we entered the Earthshot Prize because we believe that our technology can have a massive impact, right? When we look at the global energy consumption today, 
right? 20% of it is met in the form of electricity. So electrons are feeding 20% of our global energy consumption. But what about the remaining 80%, right? And this remaining 80% is still met by fuels and gases. And these are dirty molecules that we need to replace. And we believe that green hydrogen is the solution to replace those dirty molecules. But now that you're the winner, what, how do you think it will change actually the future of your business? I mean, first off, just the recognition, right, from such a prestigious prize that our solution is worth scaling has been just so well received from our partners, our team, everyone is motivated, and also in terms of the visibility, right, of the solution. So I think at the moment it's it's really getting this momentum of us, of, of individuals who are helping us scale and also um, having this sort of, um, let's say, validation and, and also this stamp of credibility because we're so young, mm -hmm. right? Now it's 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 proven, it's clear. We have um, over 200 customers and use cases across 40 mm -hmm. countries and more. And so it, it's it's no longer just the startup, but it's actually this global energy tech company that is about to make a big difference. So do you think you'll get more funding as a direct impact of it, or just more utilization, like more customers? Both. I mean, we're a publicly listed company, so anyone who wants to support us can. And then also in terms of new projects, we have, uh, of course, been getting new customers. And, you know, the idea behind Anaptor is also to make a very simple product, right? So we are building electrolyzers as products and not projects. So that means that we're making a standardized product that is simple to integrate. And by making a simple product, then more customers and a wide range of different customers can also join us, whether it is for refueling cars or refueling planes, but also creating green ammonia or green methane for industrial purposes. What are your priorities for the next <laughs> 12 months, 24 months, and five years? Absolutely. Um, uh, well, 25 years. <laughs> five years, maybe. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, Simply just looking at this year, right? Um, right now we are working on our megawatt scale electrolyzer because we know that we need a lot of green hydrogen. And so we're looking into scaling up the production of our electrolyzers and also scaling up um, the capacity, the hydrogen production of our, of our systems. And also at the moment, we're building our mass production site. And this will be a huge milestone because we are building this mass production site as a blueprint, yeah. knowing that this will not be just the only one mass production site of AM electrolyzers, but actually it will be one of many. And it is a campus, we call it the Anaptor campus, fully powered by renewables. So it's 100% green energy to mass produce uh, mm -hmm. a green product. So who uses these electrolyzers mm -hmm. actually? And again, how will your clients change mm -hmm. as you get bigger? Absolutely, great question. So we have, um, let's say, two different kinds of customers. We've got the customers who are manufacturing for example, hydrogen planes mm -hmm. or hydrogen boats. And so they are direct consumers of green hydrogen. Direct consumers of green hydrogen are also, for example, um, um, producers or suppliers of um, green gases like methane right. or ammonia. Yeah. Um, and then their end users might be container ships or, or other, other industrial players. What's your biggest dream? Um, you know, I, I think my, my biggest dream um, is is to, yes, of course, decarbonize the, the, the mobility sector and have hydrogen planes. Um, but I guess it, it is to see green hydrogen become mainstream, actually, and not just to have these, these little pockets of applications or these demos, but for it to really become the, the fuel of the future. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> that was Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua speaking with Fatea Cohen. So from making it green to using it in aviation, the world is pinning its hopes on hydrogen as one potential solution for a greener future. That's it for this week's edition of Bloomberg Green, but you can keep the conversation going by following us on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Climate. From Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green.